evening, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us for this presentation this evening, Harnessing the Power of Antibody Drug Conjugates Therapies. And tonight's presentation is brought to you by Creative Educational Concepts and is supported by an independent educational grant from Gilead Sciences. Here we go. Uh, to claim credit, you have to complete the necessary requirements, the pre-test, the post-test, and then claim your credit. Dr. Rugo will be here shortly. Uh, she will be moderating the program uh, after she comes, and she's professor of medicine and director of breast oncology and clinical trials education, and medical director for infusion services at UCSF Helen Diller Comprehensive Cancer Center in San Francisco. Uh, very pleased to have Sri Koda with us, who's an advanced uh, practitioner in ger general urinary medical oncology at Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey in New Brunswick, New Jersey. I'm Lee Schwartzberg, Chief of Medical Oncology and Hematology at renowned Pennington Cancer Institute and Professor of Medicine at the University of Nevada, Reno. Our learning objectives for the evening are, number one, to implement strategies to mitigate breast cancer health disparities based on specific drivers of inequity. Two, to integrate the latest data of antibody drug conjugates, or ADCs, to individualize treatment for metastatic breast cancer based on recent clinical, clinical evidence and updated guidelines. And three, to develop strategies for the management of adverse events associated with ADCs used to treat patients with metastatic breast cancer. We're going to start with a section on health disparities in the management of metastatic breast cancer. And uh, I'll introduce you to Deltra James, who is a patient and patient advocate. Um, and she is going to be joining us on uh, several videos. She is a New England-based mother, poet, and patient advocate. She was diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer at age 33. And uh, she's worked in a variety of uh, uh, venues to bring the word about metastatic breast cancer and triple negative breast cancer from the patient perspective. She's had a no um, notable career in advocacy and cancer communities. She works with Touch, the, breast, uh, the Black Breast Cancer Alliance, Project Life, Bright Spot Network, and, and the Cactus Cancer Society. And she's really passionate about, uh, as you'll hear, about mental wellness, um, therapeutic creative expression, and disparities. She interestingly uh, ventured into death care work as a death doula to assist fellow patients in accomplishing necessary end-of-life planning while addressing fears. So the recordings you'll hear are her thoughts and the thoughts of other women with breast cancer. So we're going to start with uh, Deltra talking about her impression of what is ideal care. Ideal care to me is my oncologist feeling like a teammate. Um, it's important for them to provide me with their full attention when we're together. I'm very aware that they have many patients and they have a limited amount of time. Um, but I think that how they spend the time with me is very important. I think it's important that they are very clear in explaining things to me so that I understand the plan um, in no uncertain terms. And I also think it's really important for them to make sure that they are getting to know me as a person, not just me as a cancer patient or my body and what it's doing and assessing what it needs. I think it's really important that they are aware of my needs outside of my physical needs um, and making sure that those are getting met. Um, and I think a big part of that is making sure that I'm aware of and have access to the entire team. So not just my oncologist who will care for me physically, but also nurse navigators, social workers within my cancer center. Um, and also 
connecting me with community, whether it's within the cancer center, like support groups or outside of it. So I think that's ideal care. And you'll hear more from Deltra in a few minutes. <clears throat> so I think two things that resonate with me from what she said is that uh, when we care for patients with cancer, it's easy for us as oncologists to focus on the cancer, but what patients are thinking about is the cancer only as one segment of their life and hopefully not the dominant segment, although it's important, but understanding their hopes, their needs, their goals during cancer treatment, particularly for metastatic breast cancer, is so critical. And the fact that there is a team that is taking care of the patient. It's not just one person. And uh, the team approach is so important. Shri, you want to yep. say anything about that? Yes, Dr. Schwarzberg, I totally agree. Um, which is why I think... Patients... Can you hear her? Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. No? Now? Yes. Okay. It is um, very challenging when um, patients come in and as providers, we have a one hour slot for a new patient and a 30 minute slot for, you know, a, a repeat visit. And then someone's on chemotherapy and they have issues and side effects and they have questions. And um, I think a multidisciplinary team definitely um, helps because the nurse will talk about the patient about a few things that maybe the doctor will not address. And then a social worker can talk about something different that the clinicians may not address. Uh, nutritionists, uh, financial counselors. I think when someone is made of all these different aspects, we cannot assume that uh, uh, cancer is the predominant factor in their lives. So yes. Yes. Sorry. So I think Sorry. what Sri talked about goes for everyone and what Delta talked about, and we want to focus part of this on some specific populations that don't do as well in metastatic breast cancer. And when you look at this slide, you see the data for broken down by race and ethnicity in terms of breast cancer incidence and mortality by, by age. And we've known for a long time now that the breast cancer specific survival rates for black women are significantly lower than white women. And that gap has been present now for many years, even though b the mortality rates are going down for both groups, they're not uh, yet reaching unity. Moreover, for, young, for women, uh, the median age of death for black women is much younger than for white women, 63 years compared to 70 years for white women. And you can see on the graphs that although the incidence of uh, breast cancer is a little bit lower, particularly as black women get older, the mortality is higher and earlier. We also know that triple negative breast cancer is more prevalent in black women than other races or ethnicities. And in fact, worldwide, the highest rate is found in black women in the United States and in West Africa. Now we know that triple negative breast cancer has traditionally had a worse prognosis than other subgroups of breast cancer, and that does contribute to the excess uh, breast cancer-related mortality for black women, but it's not the sole explanation. If you correct for other uh, factors, black women still have a higher mortality rate. In fact, it's still twofold higher. And moreover, triple negative breast cancer disproportionately affects younger premenopausal women. You can see the prevalence of triple negative breast cancer in the right and that, that um, uh, non-Hispanic blacks have the highest incidence. So we know, and what we're going to talk about tonight is some of the unmet needs in metastatic breast cancer and some of the ways that we're addressing them with antibody drug conjugates. Now, the largest group, uh, subgroup of breast cancer patients is the hormone receptor positive HER2 negative subgroup, and that represents about two thirds to three quarters of metastatic disease. HER2 positive patients represent about 15 or 20 percent, about half of them are HR positive and half are HR negative, and then triple negative breast cancer, ER negative, PR negative, HER2 negative is about 15 percent. Over time, Although 
hormone receptor positive HER2 negative breast cancer patients get treated with effective endocrine therapy today, particularly in combination in the first line and in multiple lines, at some point endocrine therapy stops working for the patients and they go on to chemotherapy. So the endocrine therapy refractory HER2 negative group represents the large majority of breast cancer, about 85% uh, at some point in their journey through metastatic breast cancer. As time goes on uh, and then patients move into chemotherapy, their survival gets shorter and shorter for each line of therapy. So giving the best therapy earlier in the course is really critical to get the best outcomes for our patients with metastatic breast cancer. So we've learned over the last few years that <clears throat> biology in, in cancer is important, but so are the social determinants of health, or SDOH, and there are multiple risk factors which impact the outcome for patients with cancer, including socioeconomic disparities, poverty. Uh, they tend to have lo lo lower rates of screening. They, ha uh, they present with a later stage, and they don't get the same care. Uh, and uh, many uh, patients who are underinsured or non-insured do not get adequate care. And something that's forgotten sometimes, and I, I know from my own experience working many years in Memphis, Tennessee, a predominantly a black and poor population, that just simple things that some people can accomplish, many people who live in poverty cannot do. For example, if they're working, they can't take the time off, or they have to use public transportation to get to the doctor's office, or no one can watch the kids. There's no one there to help them. And all of those things uh, play a very strong role in getting the best or le less than uh, best care. And then, of course, there are the structural, structural disadvantages, some of which we just talked about, and geographic barriers to care, including not only uh, in urban areas, but in rural areas. Um, lifestyle also plays a role, as we know, that um, uh, people who live in poverty have higher rates of tobacco and alcohol use and higher obesity, and tobacco and obesity are the two most common lifestyle uh, reasons for getting cancer and so forth. And then many people, especially those who are in lower socioeconomic groups, live in food deserts and can't get access to healthy nutrition. Have you found that in your population? Yes, absolutely. Um, although New Jersey is considered to be one of the more geographically advantageous and accessible areas in the country, um, that is a huge advantage for patients because they have multiple options um, in terms of picking a provider that's closer to them or um, someone that um, checks off a lot of the boxes. Um, but that's having addressed that major factor, what we see in our practice are disparities still caused by the, the social determinants, um, like you know the um, lower income, education, health literacy, insurance, transportation, um, personal finances, social support, uh, structure, housing, etc. cetera. Um, a few things that are more um, obvious would be a lack of communication when someone does not speak English. So we see that it's very pronounced in the New Brunswick area where it's a predominantly Hispanic population. And as clinicians, um, I feel guilty that I may not spend as much time as, as I do with an English speaking patient trying to educate them uh, because we're trying to get by uh, educating them about the basic facts. This is your chemotherapy, these are the most common side effects, this is what you need to tell us. So there's no time for extra information that we would otherwise give someone who is um, educated and has more questions. So that is one thing that they miss out on because of not being able to communicate in the same language. Um, the age of diagnosis also plays an important factor. People who are younger, with younger children, uh, jobs who are not financially settled yet, as opposed to people who are older. They may not have kids or they may not have uh, someone to lean on for support. Uh, they may be uh, depending on their retirement income. So that's another barrier that, that we see. And again, um, at CINJ where I work, we have nutritionists, social workers, uh, financial counselors, um, pharmacists, 
uh, navigators. We have so many resources. Despite all that, we do see that it helps with some inequities, but not all of them. Um, again, there is another factor of a personal bias. It's very difficult to convince someone who has no previous health literacy or education that this evidence-based practice, evidence-based therapies is something that they should consider. Um, where there is so much misinformation lately, um, everywhere you see social media, people talk about IV infusions of vitamin C and you know health retreats where people forego conventional therapy to, um, it's almost like shooting in the dark because they want to do that. They don't want to lose hair. They don't want to be nauseous. So they want to try something that appeals to them emotionally. That's one thing. And the, the biggest thing is um, clinical trial enrollment challenge. Um, it's very difficult to have minorities um, participate in clinical trials. Uh, even now, I think there is a stigma uh, associated with the word trials. People think of themselves as guinea pigs. Uh, they think of most of these as experimental. So the, the population we serve and treat is not the same as in the clinical trial. So I think we are studying a group of people and not necessarily treating the same group. Let's hear from Deltra uh, her impression of what the major barriers are to effective care. What I see as major barriers to effective care, it's two-sided. I see it, I do see it as systemic and I see it as um, healthcare not always being easily accessible, as well as people having their personal biases, which I think it's important for those in positions to be providing medical care, to be really aware of theirs and constantly educating themselves on the people that they are caring for. Um, on the flip side of that, I think it's important for patients like myself to be challenging and educating ourselves on beliefs that we've held when it comes to healthcare. Um, because it's very important that we are able to trust our team. And so just like any relationship, part of it is uh, me as the patient, fully believing that someone is there to help me and has my best interests in mind and challenging them when I'm feeling as if they do not. Um, I think it's being provided with materials that would challenge beliefs I have on things like clinical trials that may be beneficial to me, um, but that I, someone like myself may be wary of. And again, I just think it's all about trust. And that starts with our oncologists, with our medical team, um, making us feel seen as a person, as an individual, so that whenever they're presenting something to us to do with our care, uh, they're not just telling us, you know, this is what you're going to do or this is what we always do. Um, it needs to feel individualized and I want to hear why you think it's the best option for me. Um, I think that's, I think that those things not happening are big barriers to effective care. Welcome Dr. Rigo. <laughs> so uh, I think another way of, of saying what, uh, what Deltra was talking about is the importance of shared decision making. And we've learned that uh, we move from a paternalistic type of, um, of relationship between the providers and the patients to one where it's collaborative and really meeting the patient where they are, it's so important. She talked about uh, having uh, uh, access to care and one of the things you can see, it's quite plain here from geographical disparities that if you look at the population living in poverty, mostly across the South, um, compared to the north. And then if you look at the cancer death rate, particularly in the Mississippi Delta area and Appalachia there in red, you can see that there's a close correlation between people who are living in poverty and uh, their, their chance to, uh, to survive their cancer. So 
just finish up this part and then turn it over. So uh, here's Deltra on race and, race and ethnicity and how other socioeconomic factors affect care. I do hear from other women how, where they live, or the color of their skin, um, or their income level affects their care, their access to care. Um, and that may seem really wild for someone to imagine. I hear people complain often about, you know, feeling like they don't have access to maybe the latest and greatest. If you don't have access to one of the larger cancer centers, maybe you don't, you're not aware of clinical trials that are happening that perhaps you'd be eligible for. And then even if you do hear about those clinical trials, uh, perhaps online, how are you going to access them? How are you going to get to them? And that's where financial barriers can come into place. Um, and that's also a great place where oncologists, if they know the needs of their patient, can step in and provide some resources on occasion. You know, say someone wants to go get a second opinion, but they don't have the resources to travel to do that. Well, there are some wonderful nonprofits that help people do things like that. But without that kind of support, um, not everyone gets to have the same kind of access. And some people, they don't want to burden their families. So they'd forgo treatment that is life-saving for them um, instead of trying to figure that out or putting that financial strain on their loved ones because their their uh, cancer treatment itself is already, you know, perhaps a financial strain. And then, of course, we have people who, unless you have a team um, that happens to look like you, it can be really difficult because, again, it, the trust can be missing. Um, you can be subjected to people's prejudice, whether they're aware of it or not. Um, and it shows, and people are, people become aware of that if it's there. They see it in how their oncologist interacts with them. They see it when they uh, talk with other patients receiving care from that person, and they realize, oh, I'm not getting offered the same things, or I'm not even receiving possibly even the standard of care. Um, so that is a really common conversation that comes up. And I think it's something that, as I mentioned before, um, that's where the trust part comes in. Part of it is on the patient side and a huge part of it is on the uh, side of our care team, our medical care team. I will say that uh, you work in a, um, a slightly different, I don't know what the, um, your diversity is like where you work. Uh, Lee, and uh, whether or not you find that the economic barriers that she was talking about play a big role. I don't know how many in your cancer center do you have a lot of patients who come from, you know, are more um, challenged by cost yeah, or it's, distance? It's, uh, well, it's interesting. I, I, I mentioned earlier that I was in Memphis for many years with the largest um, predominantly black and poor uh, city, and we had those challenges of urban been in Reno for three years and I've been struck by how many advanced cases I'm seeing more than I saw at diagnosis of locally advanced or de novo metastatic cancer, partly because there's uh, underserved population, um, a large Hispanic population, so many of whom don't, as Sri was saying, do not speak English and we have that barrier and also the rural population. I have a great respect for the problems that they have because we take care of all of northern Nevada and people come from 200 miles away and they have uh, additional barriers there. So transportation's an issue, leaving work when they're self-employed uh, to come and the culture of sometimes not seeking care because of what I might call a frontier mentality or the Western mentality is, yes. is, really, yeah. is, is there as well. So uh, we can hear from Deltra again. I would like oncologists to approach their patients as if they were much more than their diagnosis, their cancer, their body. Um, 
I'd like them to look at them as more than just a chart. I think it's important for them to get to know who's your family, who's the support system that you have around you. Um, and again, they have limited time with us. So I think maybe streamlining that uh, with some sort of interview process, whether it's on paper or done online, um, I think it's important for patients to know that we have access to our oncologists. They're easily accessible in between appointments. Um, I know we have the technology to make that happen now, but for me, I think it's important for oncologists to make sure that they know their patient so that they're building trust. So I think to, to, to summarize, um, the addressing disparities is, uh, we talked about research, how critical it is. The clinical trials that are done to get most drugs approved are a failure in the sense that they don't adequately represent in the United States the patients that are being treated in the community. And we've all realized that now uh, the manufacturers, the FDA, the advocacy groups, all of our organizations, we're making um, steady progress now, although there's a long way to go in terms of getting representative clinical trials, uh, having more of the disparate populations and trying to achieve equity, uh, not just equality, but making sure that uh, additional support is given to those populations so they can receive the clinical trials and we understand how they do with new drugs as well as standard of care. And then approaching the structural barriers, which are a more difficult issue, but we have to do this as a community, uh, as an oncology community, as, uh, uh, as a society, and we have to address the implicit and explicit biases that we have, uh, further diversify the workforce, address in ways that we can do both internally at our own uh, institutions, as well as a society, the social determinants of health. And a lot of that is helped by patient navigation and uh, maybe hope you could talk about how that works at UCSF and your uh, patient navigation and how you, you help your patients. Um, I was mostly the one who was going to yeah. ask. So I'm not really prepared okay. to talk about it, but I and I think that you know navigation programs really depend on the uh, institution. We don't have patient navigators per se, but we have triage nurses who are and uh, our practice assistants who are helpful uh, in managing. We have uh, created videos to help people manage the process as well. And then you know it's an interesting question about navigators now because if you use an electronic health record. People are messaging all the time, so there's a lot of communication back and forth with the clinic about what to do and when to do it, which I think is a huge improvement over what we had before for patient communication. It, prevents, it presents a relatively large um, burden on the healthcare practitioners, so it's trying to balance that right now, which can be really challenging. Um, so we do have these tri our triage nurses who are phenomenal. They only do breast. Uh, which is also really helpful for us so that they can, you know, they're quite a bit more, um, I think, attuned to what the questions are. Yeah, on my way here, which took a really long time, as I noticed, I said, you know, the it's two hours earlier and a patient messaged in about, you know, when she's having her paracentesis and she doesn't want to get chemo on Monday. And, you know, I asked them to call her. And so we managed, you know, what her preferences are and what she wants to do. Um, in this uh, way, which I think is a whole lot better than what people did before, which was leave messages on, you know, answering machines. Some programs have a navigator who can, you know, you contact and they help you through the process of making appointments. I think our nurse practitioners and nurses together really fill that role for us, and that's worked out better um, in our setting, but I think every setting is unique, and so it really depends. I don't know if you yeah. have a navigator. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we do. Yeah. Shri. We have yeah. uh, nurse navigators. Um, they are tumor-specific, and they help patients from the point of diagnosis when they're brand new all the way to hospice. So these are, I think, yeah. what we would call our triage nurses. Yeah. So they deal with all of the issues, they manage, they talk to them all the time, they do the chemo teaching, they, yeah. uh, and they manage resources. So our social workers also help with that as well. Yeah, it definitely takes a team. And uh, I do think, I agree with you, that the best part of the EMR is, in fact, the communication capabilities across the institution and the portal that patients can use. So it's much better 
than it used to be. But these are complex issues and patients have a lot uh, of things on their plate. Uh, so having navigators helps as well. And the, uh, that goes to the multidisciplinary oncology care team. So today it really does take a village to take care of cancer patients and uh, patients should be and typically are assessed uh, by a social worker and, and also their emotional status. We screen every patient for distress and we have an algorithm by which that we can um, uh, escalate uh, the type of care they get, including social work, including uh, psychologic support if they need it. We need to do finance. We all have financial counselors now that help patients navigate the difficult finances of getting therapy. And we also have to pay attention to their cultural context, their ethnicity, their gender and social relationships, as Deltra said. So uh, we have a big issue with health literacy, as Sri talked about earlier. It's, it's complicated even for people that are relatively sophisticated. It's brand new jargon, it's, it's new terms, it's new concepts, and it's very, very difficult. So making sure that we have the appropriate staff to help um, and uh, to bring up health literacy, particularly in those populations um, that may have less education or language barriers, really important, and connecting those patients to resources, including, as we just talked about, the navigation and support resources. So get to know your patient. I think Del Deltra said that, and I think we all agree that uh, that's our goal. So I will turn this over to you. Dr. Rudo, right. to talk about the evolving landscape of uh, MBC. So I think that, you know, the previous session, I think, really just um, gave you both the patient and uh, different practice approaches to managing patients um, in the metastatic setting and, of course, translates into early stage disease, as you pointed out uh, before. Um, I think the idea of using this, the scales, which you uh, talked about briefly, did you talk about that earlier? No. Um, do you use them in your clinic? Uh, we do a distress screen and a depression screen on every patient uh, and I, at intake and periodically. And does it automatically result in referrals? Like it does and depends on the level uh, the, the numerical level. And you have the same? Yes. Yeah, and I think that that's actually an amazing thing that can be done through the electronic health record is these automated referrals um, so that when you see the patient, there's an automated, you have to actually click it and make it go right. through. But right. Um, it, the scoring system of what patients ask when they are coming in to see you each time will help give you these scores that help with referrals. And then you don't even have to think about which referral you're making them to. Yeah. The specific score brings up a referral. Now, that may or may not be appropriate for the patient. That's why you have to go through and decide about signing it, et cetera. So um, I think that that's a really a great new approach. So we're going to talk about antibody drug conjugates uh, now and change to something a little bit different, uh, another way of uh, managing our patients and treating patients uh, w who have uh, advanced disease uh, to try and improve outcome. And we're going to hear you know, a lot about antibody drug conjugates at this meeting, both at the plenary session and the LBA session for breast cancer on Sunday morning, um, and then multiple other uh, presentations, uh, which I think will be quite interesting. Um, I think everybody here are, uh, I don't know if you had an idea of how many people are uh, practicing or did you ask no, earlier? No, no, no. I know because we're starting late because of the traffic, <laughs> but um, I, I, how many people are, have, are given antibody drug conjugates? Are you treating, treating patients? Anybody? So some people. Yeah. yeah. And then other people who are involved in patient care? Yeah. Okay, great. So antibody drug conjugates are, you know, we refer to them as a revolution in delivery of chemotherapy. And uh, we, you know, these are sort of, it's a targeted uh, delivery mechanism for chemotherapy, but there's a lot of other aspects to antibody drug conjugates. And the key things about these drugs are an antibody that delivers the uh, payload to the cancer cell. But it turns out that uh, the antibody actually has been a relatively um, uh, stagnant uh, thing. We have a few antibodies that we've you know, been able to capitalize on, HER2, TROPE2 largely, and then there's a lot of investigations going on with others. Uh, but the linker uh, 
technology has changed tremendously. And the linkers really have allowed this bystander effect where you may have uh, the payload that can kill cells that don't express the target very much. And that can make a big difference, uh, I think, in the efficacy. Uh, also, we've uh, improved the payload, uh, not for all ADCs, but we're working on improving the payload. And uh, the uh, issue about the payload is you want something um, that is highly potent in small amounts and doesn't have cumulative toxicity over time. So most of the payloads that are being given are not effective as naked drugs because you have to give, to give enough in the circulation, you get uh, toxicity that's not uh, manageable. But if you can give them in small amounts and they're delivered in a high concentration to the cancer cell, that's not the, uh, the same issue. So we seem to be able to give these antibody drug conjugates and deliver a highly potent uh, small amount of toxin to the cancer cell with a lot of efficacy. And this idea of the bystander effect is quite intriguing because many of the ADCs have effects in the brain. And we know antibodies are really big. They're not supposed to get into the brain. Uh, but uh, in this situation, um, the, there may be some degree of a bystander effect where drug is carried into the CSF, um, even when it's not attached to the antibody, because we've seen quite uh, significant effects. So, as I mentioned, we have fairly stable antibodies right now that we've been using, and there's a lot of interest in sort of pushing this forward and uh, looking at how we can capitalize on this novel mechanism of delivery of chemotherapy. There are true trope 2 antibody drug conjugates that have been studied in breast cancer and in, are being studied in other cancers as well. Um, so the uh, sasuchizumab govitecan approved for uh, several cancers is uh, got a drug to antibody ratio of eight to one. Datapotumab drugs to can four to one. Of course, the payload is different, although both of them are topoisomerase inhibitors. SN38, the active metabolite of irinotecan, is the payload for sasuchizumab, whereas for datapotumab, it's deruxtecan and exatecan derivative. That's the same drug that's on uh, trastuzumab deruxtecan, where, but that drug, that antibody drug conjugate has a drug to antibody ratio of eight to one. So these are all quite different. There's also some differences in the linker itself. Um, they're, uh, they're all cleavable linkers, but uh, one is a hydrolyzable pH-sensitive linker for SN38. The other is a tetrapeptide-based cleavable linker for DXD. And that actually determines the drug-to-antibody ratio to some degree and also delivery of drugs. So drug-to-antibody ratio is certainly not the um, end-all. We thought it was when these first came out, but it's not the end all in efficacy by any means because the delivery of the toxins and their uh, mechanisms are quite different. Uh, both of these uh, tro trope 2 ADCs um, have a bystander anti-tumor effect. As far as we can tell, trope 2 is expressed on most tumors. So in breast cancer, we found you know more than a 95% expression. And as you know from HER2, we're not great at determining ex the even small amounts of expression with antibodies. So you know, I think that uh, we, we do believe there's a bystander effect, but it's a little bit hard to characterize. Uh, the payload for uh, sasuchizumab has a long half-life. Um, and the payload, Durextacan, has a relatively shorter systemic half-life. So let's talk a little bit about triple negative breast cancer. Uh, Lee, do you want to sure. talk about it? Thank you. So we're going to start with uh, the data from Sasituzumab uh, govitecan. And the ASCENT trial was a phase three study uh, based on phase two studies that showed that there was efficacy in triple negative breast cancer. As we mentioned earlier, triple negative breast cancer remains uh, a persistent problem in metastatic disease. Uh, in general, we have uh, limited resources to take care of this. Uh, standard chemotherapy and in the first line setting, uh, using immunotherapy as well um, with pembrolizumab for patients that do express pdl one based on our current data. But once you get to second line and beyond, our standard approaches have been to use single agent chemotherapy, which has been less than spectacular at improving our patients' lives, their progression free survival, and their overall survival. So, this was a phase three trial comparing SG to treatment of physician's choice, and that included several different chemotherapy agents, as not any single one is not uh, necessarily better than the other. Patients were eligible for this trial if they had had two or more chemotherapies. So, this 
was a heavily pretreated group of patients, although there were some patients, and we'll see the subset analysis of those that had had neoadjuvant or adjuvant therapy and one line of chemotherapy. And also, interestingly, patients with stable brain metastases were allowed in this trial. Uh, Sasituzumab govotecan is given in a day one and eight every 21 day schedule. So there's two doses every 21 days and the treatment of physician choice was given depending on how that drug, uh, what particular drug is given in a typical schedule. Pa the primary endpoint was progression free survival. Here is the uh, data in the uh, brain met negative population, which was the majority of patients in ASCENT. And the ASCENT trials did demonstrate statistically and clinically significant improvement in both PFS and OS over single agent chemotherapy in the primary study population. So if you look at the left-hand curve, the Kaplan-Meier curve there, you see that the median progression-free survival for treatment of physician choice, standard chemotherapy was very short. Again, these patients had two, three, or four lines of prior therapy, and essentially the median was less at the first time they were uh, evaluated at two months after. So only 1.7 months for progression-free survival. However, SG improved the PFS to 5.6 months, a 61% improvement in progression-free survival. And the study is now mature enough to look at overall survival in the right-hand curve. And you can see that there's almost a doubling of overall survival from 6.7 months median in the uh, treatment of physician choice to 12.1 months in uh, the SG group. And that represents a 52% improvement. If we look at a landmark analysis at 24 months, tw over 22% of patients were still alive who got SG. Uh, compared to only 5% uh, with chemotherapy. This looks at a subset of patients um, who were uh, treated with two lines of therapy, one of which was in the adjuvant. So they only received one prior line of therapy. It's a smaller subgroup here, but these are patients who were also at higher risk. And you can see in these, this subgroup population that the median progression-free survival uh, remained intact at about 5.7 months for SG, only 1.5 months for uh, TPC here. Again, a 60% improvement in these uh, more aggressive patients, but had only one line of therapy. And the overall survival uh, continues to show a very strong doubling, again, of overall survival uh, from 4.9 months to 10.9 months median, and has a ratio of 0.51. Um, finish up this. So there are ongoing trials based on this encouraging data. So the drug SG was approved for triple negative breast cancer based on the ascent. And now it's being studied in other populations, including in the first line, PDL1 negative, triple negative breast cancer population. So as I mentioned, the standard approach for most patients who are PDL1 positive in the first line metastatic TMBC is a combination of pembrolizumab and uh, a chemotherapy regimen, uh, and much like is shown here in TPC. Um, uh, but these are for the PDL1 negative population. So here we're doing head to head SG ADC versus standard chemotherapy. Um, and these patients had to be all be tested for PDL1. It had to be at least six months since they finished treatment in the curative setting. And interestingly, uh, anti pdl one agents are allowed in the curative setting. That has become a standard for us now for triple negative breast cancer patients in the neoadjuvant and adjuvant setting uh, based on data from Keynote 522. And so uh, this is a very important trial because for this 60% of patients or so that are pdl one negative, we still don't have uh, in the first line setting uh, yet uh, an approved therapy other than standard chemotherapy. And these patients will be treated uh, for progression-free survival. Um, and uh, ASCENT4 is essentially comparing to what we do with pdl one positive. So SG and PEMBRO versus chemo and PEMBRO, very similar to what I, I just discussed. So these two trials together will uh, give us some very valuable information. And I will pass it back to you. Hope. So uh, we'll talk a little bit more about HER2 low status. 
uh, when uh, Lee talks to us about TDXD in a little bit. But, you know, it's interesting if you look at, uh, you know, I think that we don't really know that we're detecting HER2 low well. Uh, this is the data that was uh, published by Shatini et al. that suggested that more patients who are HR positive of HER2 low disease, uh, defined as 1 plus or 2 plus without gene amplification compared to TNBC, where about 66% were zero. And indeed, there is a group that has no expression, but we'll hear on Sunday about TDXT in 150 patients with ultra low disease that are not zero but less than 1 plus by ASCO CAP criteria. And I think that will be interesting. I mean, I, we have seen some other data we'll look at in just a moment that suggests that, you know, you can have sort of continuous efficacy, but it goes down as you have less and less expression, but it doesn't go away. So it's going to be very interesting, I think, to look at that. So it brought up a lot of interest in ADCs and HR-positive disease. And, of course, it's the most common subset of breast cancer uh, worldwide is patients who have HR-positive HER2-negative disease. And Tropix 2 evaluated sasituzumab versus treatment of physician choice. And I have to say, in all of these trials, with the exception of what we'll hear Sunday, DB06, because that was a different group. So most of these patients had already received taxanes. So that's why you don't see taxanes in the TPC. But if you're like post-taxane, we mostly give aribulin. So about 50% in every single trial that is in the second line or greater setting of patients got aribulin. Uh, and then unlike ASCENT, which allowed any n number of lines of treatment, uh, the Tropix trial uh, said you could have one but not more than three, four lines of chemotherapy for metastatic disease. Now, it's interesting because uh, when we're thinking about ADCs, this group of patients had a median of three lines of prior chemotherapy for metastatic disease, so they're very heavily pretreated. Um, and the, of course, primary endpoint was PFS. We saw a statistically significant improvement in progression-free survival and overall survival comparing sasituzumab in this heavily pretreated group of patients compared to TPC. Um, and notably, at 12 months, three times as many patients were free from progression who got SASI uh, versus those who got the standard chemotherapy. And then you can see at 12 months, there was also a big difference in overall survival uh, of, uh, you know, if you look at the, the number, it's more than 13% or close to 14%. So, you know, I think for patients, this is very meaningful. Um, also, there was an improvement in response, which we would expect, and an uh, extended, you know, there's always concern about balancing benefit versus toxicity. Here we saw an extended time to deterioration of global health status and fatigue versus uh, TPC. The only difference was with diarrhea, which is a side effect of sasituzumab we'll talk about later, uh, where the quality of life was relatively similar, uh, but it wasn't better with sasituzumab when we look at individual scales. Um, we looked at um, IHC status just because there was a lot of interest in whether or not there was, you know, this was before I think we understood that HER2 IHC status, when it's not HER2 positive, has no impact on anything really much. But, uh, and it didn't have an impact here either. So there was no impact on efficacy. It was seen across whether it was IHC zero or a one to two plus and ish negative. Um, and uh, then this is the overall survival data, which also shows similar uh, lack of impact of HER2 status. Um, so uh, now, uh, let's see. Or am I switching to you? Um, maybe I'll just mention Destiny. Do you want to talk, mention Destiny? Yeah, either way. Um, so we talked about her too low a little bit, and you know I think everybody's aware of Destiny Breast 4 that was uh, presented two years ago at this meeting, uh, right after the pandemic. Everybody's very excited to see a positive trial in the plenary session, so uh, TDXD versus TPC. These patients had centrally confirmed HER2 low disease. They had received a median of one line of prior chemotherapy for metastatic disease, and the endpoint was in the HR positive HER2 low population. You can see 50% of patients received aribulin. Um, and then this is uh, some updated data that was presented at ESMO last year uh, from the New England Journal paper from 2022. Progression-free survival was markedly improved with TDXD compared to treatment of physician choice, um, and that was uh, continued at the updated analysis. Um, the PFS initially was done by blinded independent central review, so the hazard ratio is 0.51. Once they switched to the investigator review, which was the update, the hazard ratio went to 0.37, which is interesting because, you know, the investigators generally, you know, when they like a drug, were waiting to call progression apparently longer than the, because this was unblinded, longer than the blinded independent central review. Um, and the HR positive cohort is uh, on the, I think, left for you. 
and uh, then all patients, which included a small exploratory cohort of hormone receptor negative HER2 low diseases on the right, uh, that included just uh, 58 patients. So 40 got TDXD and 18 received uh, standard chemotherapy. And then the updated overall survival, very similar here. In the bottom uh, table, the original primary analysis is broken out for the HR negative patients. And again, overall response was also improved as you would expect in a trial like this with, again, nice results. Now I mentioned about DAISY. Um, this goes along with the HER2 low idea. So you can see in the pink is IHC zero. There were 37 patients. Um, the PFS was better if you were HER2 positive than if you were HER2 low. And then if you were HER2 zero, it was the lowest. So there's definitely a continuum there even by immunohistochemistry. Um, and you can see that for the patients who had HR negative disease, the PFS was just 2.1 months. Uh, for HR positive, it was 4.5 months. But I think that these numbers are so small, it's a little bit hard to know. And we'll see a lot more about this ultra low population on uh, Friday, Sunday morning when uh, Giuseppe Grigliano presents Destiny Breast 06 with TDXD and HR positive disease in the first line setting. Um, and then uh, Ascento 7 is an ongoing study in the first line uh, chemotherapy setting for HR positive, regardless of uh, HER2 IHC, uh, which is enrolling very nicely. It's planning for about 654 patients. And again, randomizing to sasotizumab versus treatment of physician choice. But in the first line setting, you can use CAPE or Ataxane. I think it's really interesting that we, we've moved beyond this uh, trying to uh, ascertain 1 plus versus 2 plus. And we'll see. And it looks like if you have better drugs, that it really doesn't matter. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, I think we'll see more. Um, our colleague, uh, David Rim, who's at uh, Yale, has been working on trying to make a quantitative uh, test for uh, HER2 IHC. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot of interest in looking at this. And they might have some data later this year, I think maybe at ESMO, about the impact of the quantitative assessment uh, looking at RNA and uh, quantitative protein measures to see how that affects efficacy. And I think this kind of data will help us a lot in the clinic moving forward, uh, but we don't have it yet. Yeah, and uh, IHC was originally designed to separate HER2 positive and those patients who would uh, benefit from trastuzumab versus lower, not designed for a, a lower threshold. So that's what Hope is talking about. Hopefully will allow us to define that much better. And uh, of course, Destiny Breast 06, I think people are aware of, is being presented at 7.30 in the morning on Sunday, TDXD versus uh, chemotherapy of physician choice in patients. So 850 patients, but they enrolled about 866. And um, the, uh, of the 850 that were enrolled, 150 were designated to be ultra low, so not zero and less than one plus. So it'd be very interesting. There's already been a press release saying that progression-free survival was better with TDXD as we expected in the overall population, but also in the subset of patients with HER2 ultra low disease. And that's the extent of the press release, as you can imagine. So we'll see that later. Um, and uh, I think we'll, we also, this slide is really just to show you that expression of trope two doesn't impact the efficacy of sasotuzumab similar to expression of HER2 for TDXD. Um, do you want to speak yeah. a little bit to the guidelines? Yeah. yeah, so these are the updated guidelines from NCCN, and I think they're really useful for us in the clinic um, because it really breaks down by, uh, this is first for triple negative breast cancer, if you're positive for PDL one and or uh, BRCA. So all patients should be tested for BRCA1 and 2 mutations because we have therapy for that, alaparib and talazoparib. They're all category one and preferred. So we use the biomarkers. So even in triple negative, biomarkers are important, uh, PDL1 and uh, BRCA1 and 2. In the second line setting, um, sasotuzumab govotecan is category one preferred based on the ascent data that we showed as long as there is no germline uh, mutation and patients hadn't received prior PARP. And then uh, trastuzumab deruxtecan is also category one uh, preferred uh, for the second line setting. And then beyond that, it's based on other biomarkers or systemic therapy. For HER2, uh, HER2 negative HR positive patients, again, uh, these patients should be encouraged to undergo germline BRCA1 and 2 testing because we have the same therapy 
Uh, it's agnostic to whether or not they're HR positive or negative. Systemic chemotherapy has been the standard of care up until now, and in second line, based on the data you've seen, trastuzumab deruxtecan is category one preferred, and uh, if they're not a candidate for trastuzumab deruxtecan, then sasituzumab is preferred as well. So we mentioned earlier that we have another kit on the block, blocked out of potomab deruxtecan, um, and uh, we talked about that um, uh, the fact that you can actually give the drug every three weeks. Sasituzumab is given day one and day eight every three weeks. Um, and uh, they have different uh, dose-limiting toxicities. Um, in dose escalation, sasituzumab was neutropenia. For adatapotumab, it was rash and stomatitis. So, uh, of course, these drugs are now dosed uh, in their uh, final dosing schedule. So, uh, Lee, tell us a little bit about Tropion Breast 01. So Tropion Breast 01 is a phase three trial of data DXD versus chemo in the HR positive population. Uh, very similar to what we saw one to, in the previous trials in terms of design, one to two prior lines of chemotherapy, good PS, and the characteristics are shown there. I'll show about most of these patients had one line of prior therapy. Importantly, the vast majority of them had had a prior CDK46, which is our standard, and virtually all of them had had taxane or anthracycline. And here's the PFS, uh, again, by uh, investigator assessment here. And you see there was a superiority for a data DXD versus treatment of physician choice at each landmark analysis. And uh, the hazard ratio is 0.64. And the time to subsequent therapy is much longer as well. And this is important for patients uh, with HR positive disease in particular. So they stayed on data longer than uh, standard uh, therapy. As you'd expect, again, the response rate was substantially higher for uh, data DXD compared to uh, investigator choice. We don't have the survival data yet. The study is still relatively immature, but already there is a trend uh, favoring data DXD with a hazard ratio of 0 .4, 0 0.84 and will await uh, further updates, which are protocol specified. Yeah, it's actually really interesting now. You know, we're now so used to seeing overall survival benefit with these ADCs, you know, now uh, certainly in HER2 positive, in HER2 low, in triple negative, in HR positive, all survival benefits from ADCs. But now the ADCs are available, certainly in the U.S. Now, they're not available for everybody around the world. So these trials are going to be impacted, we think, by the geography of where patients are enrolled and the availability for rescue with another ADC. So if you got randomized to control and you have access to another ADC or sequential ADCs, that may uh, negate the survival benefit that we've seen. So it's going to be very interesting to see what happens with subsequent therapies. We saw this with Monarch 3, right? Right. So, so it's a great problem to have. It's one uh, we didn't have <laughs> until recently when we used to, uh, two months of the PFS was Herald, and right. we've gone beyond that. Patients are doing better. Uh, and then in terms of, uh, as Hope mentioned, there are some um, specific treatment-related adverse events that occur with data DXD. Um, there is, in particular, the toxicities of dry eye, which is mostly low-grade, not a big problem. Um, there is nausea and, and, uh, stoma and mainly stomatitis, which is uh, a somewhat less common uh, toxicity for some of the other drugs. And the stomatitis does occur mostly low grade in about half the patients in, in this trial. And then uh, the typical uh, fatigue, and we do see some alopecia with this drug as well. So mucositis and stomatitis is something that we have to pay attention to. I will. Uh, bring your attention to the fact, though, that there was no prophylaxis in this trial uh, there was. designated for stomatitis initially. Anyway, we 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 told everybody to use steroid mouthwash, right? Tropion breast O one, but the problem <laughs> is it's not available around the world, so they didn't provide the prophylaxis. Right. But uh, a lot of people used it in the U.S., and I think it did contribute to a lower rate of stomatitis. But we can't even track who used it or who didn't, and in many countries where it's not available. There isn't a compounding, you know, where you could take like IV dexamethasone and dilute it, but you have to have a compounding pharmacy. So people would take the dexamethasone pills and crush them. And who yeah, knows how that knows, works. Yeah. So um, it is an, uh, a still an ongoing question that's going to be answered by uh, clinical trials.
And one more thing about this drug, it's Deruxtecan. So there is a little bit of ILD, but it was low grade and uh, the percentages were lower than we saw with TDXD, for example, at least in this trial. Yeah, really important. And uh, the dry eye doesn't seem to be a big issue either. You know, we do see some grade three uh, stomatitis and, you know, we'll present on Monday data from Dato DXD plus Dervalumab from the iSpy2 trial where we just gave four doses as an initial block of treatment. Um, and we did see, you know, stomatitis, but again, mostly it was lower grade. But there's a few people who get high grade and, I, you know, grade three, we don't really know why. Uh, and they respond to dose reduction. So it's an interesting question. I'm sure there's some pharmacogenomics, which we've seem to have figured out with sasetizumab a little, as we'll talk about in a moment, but not here yet. So, um, and then uh, of course, tropion Bresto 2 and triple negative disease in the first line setting uh, in patients who are, have uh, pd one negative disease or in countries where pd one is not available, uh, pd one targeted agents are not available. So we have a new challenge now uh, because we now have multiple ADCs in the clinic and we don't have a lot of data yet on sequencing. We don't know if we can see responses, if the payload is similar uh, as for these, they're not identical, but they're both uh, topoisomerase one inhibitors. So what are the mechanisms of resistance to ADCs? This is a very important area of research right now in terms of just understanding how starting with one and going to a second agent, we have TDXD, we have SG, and we'll soon uh, presumably have Dato DXD, which is not yet approved. And what is the best strategy? These are very important issues that remain to be elucidated. In our consortium, we have a uh, trial called Trade DXD, and we also have a registry trial. This one is looking at TDXD and Dato DXD in sequencing for both ER positive and uh, ER negative disease. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see whether this is uh, rethought based on the data from DB06. We'll wait and see, you know, whether we'll include patients who aren't so classically HER2 low. Uh, but that trial is starting up this year uh, and in the next few months, I think. And then there's a registry study also looking at sasetuzumab and TDXD uh, run by my colleague Laura Hubbard also through our consortium. So uh, we're going to talk now a little bit more about adverse events. Um, I think, you know, we all agree that this is a really exciting area of treatment, uh, but obviously we want to manage the adverse events up front and be aware of them. So I'll turn the podium over to you, Suri. Talking about um, the safety profile for sasetuzumab um, govotecan, uh, the two more prominent um, side effects have been across all studies, neutropenia and diarrhea. Uh, and neutropenia has been, um, and diarrhea, they both have black box warnings uh, for breast cancer, and they have also been the dose-limiting toxicities. Oh, like we mentioned. So in the management of um, neutropenia in sasetuzumab and breast cancer, primary prophylaxis with the GCSF was not used in clinical trials. Um, the plan was to do a CBC on days one and eight, and the guidelines uh, dictated that if an ANC was less than 1,500 on day one of any cycle or less than 1,000 on day eight with or without neutropenic fever, um, the, the plan is to hold it and resume when recovered. And for severe neutropenia, dose reductions were um, encouraged. Guideline. Um, let's see. We actually found just before you move on from neutropenia, the, uh, we're presenting in a poster tomorrow, a pooled analysis of over 1,000 patients with toxicity with sasetizumab and um, in a variety of different diseases and studies. And it's interesting, you know, people who got prophylactic growth factors, remember these patients had a lot of prior treatment, right? So the data that exists is not in patients treated in the first line metastatic setting or in the post neoadjuvant setting where we have trials now. Uh, but if they got growth factors prophylactically, uh, less than 10% required any hold or dose reduction. So clearly, you know, growth factors play a really big role in uh, managing the neutropenia proactively for these patients. Have you, um, either of you, done a Q2 week dosing? You know, it's an interesting question because we don't have the data on it, but I have treated an 82-year-old with triple negative disease with every other week dosing, full dose, and she stayed on for eight months. 
And she definitely could not have tolerated day one or day eight. I think it's an interesting idea, maybe for the GI toxicities also. Yes. Yeah, and I would say in the community, uh, in doing some focus groups over the last few months, it's, it's growing in use even without uh, data. Because mm -hmm. that trouble with day eight, when you hold, what do you do? Do you start the you next have to week? Yeah, everything. you have to reschedule yeah. everything. <laughs> so it may be an interesting approach. At our place, we have um, a patient who is at the two-year mark with the Q2 week with Nilasta dosing. And um, a little bit of uh, nursing intervention here. We try to educate patients that neutropenia is asymptomatic, but it does increase the susceptibility to infections. Um, and the one thing I always make sure is that patients, all patients have thermometers. You'd be surprised at how many people don't have thermometers at home and they have to promptly notify a fever of 100.4, cough, sore throat, little things that people don't re really associate with neutropenia. So that will be my um, nursing interventions mm -hmm. section. Um, in the management of diarrhea, I've also seen, um, again, based on my nursing experience, that the um, classification or grading is very important. If someone has a baseline bowel movements of three per day, if they're having five bowel movements a day, it sounds like a lot, but really it's still grade one. So I think um, assessing um, either is it acute diarrhea, is it delayed diarrhea, is it combined with abdominal cramping, is there a, 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 maybe a chance that they have an infection like C. diff, so I think all of these are considerations. Um, usually we do go for the high dose loperamide, which is four milligrams, two tablets uh, of two milligrams, first dose, and then one tablet of two milligrams every subsequent loose stool. Uh, we do it for typically for a total of eight doses, and um, octreotide may be considered for more severe cases. Yeah, we found out we have a patient who, and we'll talk about pharmacogenomics in a moment, but she's an intermediate metabolizer and had a lot of diarrhea, but fabulous response with terrible resistant triple negative disease. And so we kept trying all these things. You know, if you don't have the immediate diarrhea, which I have never seen, uh, and it's this delayed diarrhea, you know, giving atropine with your treatment isn't going to help at all, right? And uh, I haven't given oral atropine, but we put her on octreotide. It was actually my APP's mm -hmm. uh, recommendation. And it's a very painful injection, but if you ice it beforehand, that seems mm -hmm. to work pretty well. And it completely controlled her diarrhea. I mean, completely controlled it, and it's the only thing that works. She took all the oral drugs. So it is something I feel more encouraged about. Okay, and for severe diarrhea, um, we do consider hospital admission um, and a little bit more aggressive treatment. And we, we try to hold uh, treatment until symptoms resolve to grade one and then resume with um, a level one dose reduction. Okay, this is, um, if we have um, nutrition consult, that definitely helps. Um, and also encouraging the patients to report anything right away instead of sitting on it and trying to see if it gets better without any intervention. Um, oral hydration, and if not possible, we bring them in for IV hydration. Okay, we'll talk a little bit about nausea and alopecia. Um, at our facility, we do the, the triple combination before, which is a 5-HT3 antagonist, a dexamethasone, or plus or minus um, NK3, NK1 antagonist. So we have not really seen a lot of nausea and vomiting in these patients, and we do supply, um, we do discharge them with a home supply of either ondansetron or compazine. I'm not sure if you see a lot of nausea in this patient population? No, I really haven't. I mean, we give our, our triplet, you know, pre-meds, and we taper off in some of the patients because they just don't get that much nausea, and they don't get any delayed nausea. So that's really good. I mean, it's not a major toxicity for sasituzumab for most patients. Yeah, I would agree. Um, a little bit about alopecia. I know that for women who've been uh, through this before, uh, or maybe they have a little bit of regrowth, and then to be back on sasituzumab, which um, almost 50% will have uh, prolonged alopecia. We do suggest um, a wig beforehand. Um, for some patients whose loss of eyebrows is especially distressing, we recommend microblading when done safely. That's pretty effective. Um, we dearly do not use scalp cooling. Um, other uh, more common sense kind of advice would be avoiding heavy eye makeup. Um, you always use a sunscreen. Maybe baby products, which usually don't have a lot of harsh chemicals, mild shampoo, and moisturizing. 
Have you used Latisse for uh, eyelashes? Not really. In worst cases, we have sent them to um, a dermatology consult, but Latisse never came up. We give Latisse all the time. Yeah, yeah. We, we, I, I use yeah. it fairly often. Yeah. In, in early stage cancer. Yeah, I mean, I think it's better for faster yeah. recovery yeah. than yeah. possibly uh, preventing hair loss of uh, right. eyelashes. hasn't really been started there, but, you know, for recovery, it's really good. Yeah. And, um, and the, you know, a, a fair number of our patients use scalp cooling. Uh, we don't have the data on it. And, you know, scalp cooling is a funny thing. You know, you have to have a lot of experience in the capping and, you know, et cetera. You know, how, we don't really know how long to leave it on. But we've had some people who were successful in keeping their hair. It's much harder with Sassy uh, than with, say, TDXD, where hair loss is variable. And if you use a cold cap, it completely uh, eliminates the hair loss in our experience in any case. Um, and... Uh, you know, we have a few questions have come in here we'll get to in just a moment, but um, in uh, this, uh, so this slide talks about the polymorphisms that I was talking about earlier, and UGT1A1 uh, is a uh, polymorphism that affects enzymatic function, and, you know, people who get, treat colon cancer give Irene Otican. It's a classic measurement to see whether or not you're going to get too much toxicity. So we looked at this because SN38 is the drug that needs to be metabolized by UGT1A1. And uh, we looked at the most common phenotypes, so there are many others, and you can see about 13% in ascent and 9% in tropics O2 or star 28 uh, homozygous. And in that group now, it's about 10% in the 1,000 patients that will present tomorrow morning. Uh, who had, were star 28 homozygotes. And these patients have more diarrhea in particular and a little more neutropenia. Uh, we're pretty good at managing neutropenia, so you might not notice that as much. It's the diarrhea that's really an issue. And then I have my one patient, you know, if you look at the uh, star 1, star 28 heterozygotes, um, the diarrhea rate does not look like it's much increased. But if you look at Tropic O2, it's double that of star 1. It's just there aren't very many patients. And mm. uh, so my experience, that was associated with more diarrhea in our patient. And uh, dose reduction in octreotide were effective. But, you know, 40% of patients are heterozygotes. Um, and then there is also uh, not a lot of data, but this is one paper that's looking at uh, racial and ethnic heterogeneity. And there are uh, many other poor metabolizing phenotypes. They're just not that common in the largely uh, Caucasian population that's been studied. Um, so here you can see that there are you know, a fair number of poor metabolizers around the world and that they vary a lot based on ethnicity, albeit with small numbers. And there's a study being proposed to the Alliance by my colleagues uh, trying to look at this in a larger population of patients and then dosing based on the polymorphism, which I think would be really fascinating. I think in general, pharmacogenomics have been underutilized in, in oncology. Absolutely, they're so complicated. Really, they're very complicated, but, but the data, even for or in a tea can, it's in the label, and it's usually ignored. Yeah. So. We have um, just a little bit of time to uh, talk about the toxicity of yeah. TDXD. Mm -hmm. Sure. So uh, TDXD does have black box warning for ILD, pneumonitis. The immunologic toxicity is common. Neutropenia, as we talked about, and the other uh, fatigue. Alopecia in about 40% of patients. And nausea and vomiting uh, was a problem initially with uh, TDXD, but it is now recognized by NCCN as a highly emetogenic uh, um, regimen and using a triplet or quadruplet as per the NCCN guidelines uh, gets rid of most of the nausea and vomiting associated with it. You have constipation diarrhea as we just talked about. The ILD is something to spend a bit of time on. Uh, we know that ILD does occur it's around 12 to 15 percent across all indications if you lump uh, at the dosing that's used, uh, the 5.4 milligrams per kilogram. Most of them low grade, but occasionally fatal. So it has to be addressed. It has to be thought about in any patient who's getting TDXD. So um, at grade one, we, uh, it, you should, as grade one, asymptomatic ILD hold the uh, drug and observe or treat with steroids. Most people are treating with steroids. Grade two or higher, treat with steroids and uh, discontinue. Uh, but what to do with grade one? I think, Hope, if you want to address. We looked at the incidence of patients who had a grade one ILD, recovered, and then were retreated with uh, TDXD. So was that safe and could you retreat? Because that's the recommendation. 
Um, so it includes DBO4, uh, but uh, also gastric cancer um, and lung cancer patients, as well as the original umbrella trial. And it was actually really interesting because uh, we found that most people were able to retreat at the same dose. The median time to retreatment was about a month, which wasn't bad. A small number of patients had a second ILD. There was no mortality in any of these patients from ILD, which was really encouraging. And the patients who, uh, regardless of whether they had a second ILD or not, um, a third of the patients were retreated for more than six months. Um, and uh, 18% were retreated for more than 12 months. So, you know, clearly this is a huge benefit for patients to be able to retreat them if they've recovered from grade one um, ILD. And overall, we could retreat about 70% of patients without a dose reduction. I have dosed w reduced one patient who had recurrent, had an ILD2 event, uh, and she was able to stay on for another eight months with a dose reduction without recurrent ILD. I'm a big treater with steroids. Uh, though for grade one ILD to speed up recovery, which um, I think may help. It's hard to know. Neutropenia, interestingly about TDXD, and the same is true for uh, DATO DXD, there's just not a lot of bone marrow suppression, but we see other uh, types of toxicities. And here's the ILD instructions that Lee went through with you in detail. In terms of Can nausea, the same thing. Can yeah, we give a triplet therapy and uh, usually effective. And it is really effective. The one thing about TDXD that's interesting is this delayed nausea. So we use a lot of olanzapine for that, um, which can uh, help a lot uh, because there are people who are nauseated out, you know, to 10 days, et cetera. Yeah, definitely seeing longer nausea and vomiting after multiple regimens. And olanzapine is a great drug for that. We started only 2.5 milligrams, 5. though, um, and sometimes give half that. Yes. So Five people get sleepy. Sedating, yeah. I just wanted to bring up a few of the uh, questions uh, before we get into the case study. But so one question was, um, in my rural area, access to care is challenging, distance, and financial. Is there anything we can do, you know, resources to improve access? Because you're dealing with also a population who come from far away, having done a, yeah. some rotation in federal health planning in Nevada in 19, yeah. 1979, I think. Um, I, I was a really far drive. Yeah, <laughs> I, I know. And uh, we have... We have people who don't have a hospital uh, that, that's fully equipped within 100 miles, and it's difficult. I think um, one of the strategies that, that can work is a hub-and-spoke type of model where you have good communication with the uh, primary care practitioners or have a trained APP in particular um, who can, is very good at managing toxicity as most of them are and can communicate with the oncologist and also since the, one of the good things about the pandemic is the ability to do virtual and telemedicine, and we are doing that. We do that with Winnemucca, uh, and we can, we can actually do cardiac evaluations and have the patients at the hospital. So it's almost as good, not quite as good as having them in person, but it definitely makes a difference. We actually have a mobile screening unit led by an APP. Mo Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, going yes. into the community. Yeah. Screening is great. I think yeah. the care of the, you know, metastatic patients can be quite complicated, though. So uh, I do think telemedicine has made a really big uh, difference in that. And the other thing is just our communication. So we talk to physicians in rural communities, and I talk to people around the world all the time about managing various strategies. So, you know, having a group collaboration makes a really big difference. And there's actually this um, international uh, collaboration that one of our faculty, Sam Brunfield, developed, and there's an educational manuscript on this. It's a community of practice, they call it. And uh, the whole idea is for international education and educational tools to help. And I think that's another thing that can uh, help people who are you know, practitioners who are practicing in quite rural communities. Um, there's also a question about why ADCs will work when there's no little to antigen expression in the tumor. Like, why should they work? I mean, why shouldn't we all be checking for uh, HER2-0 and TROPE-2-0? That's a great question. I don't think we know enough about it yet. I mean, HER2 is expressed in, to my knowledge anyway, in every breast cancer cell. I mean, there are multiple, it's just that it's tenfold to a hundredfold higher in a HER2 positive. So what we don't know is the lower limit of uh, antigen expression. To, to, and with the bystander effect, you may not need a lot of cells in a cluster to get the effect, which is a clinical effect. But I think there's, there's much to be learned there. 
Uh, trope 2, we didn't mention before, it, it's not a direct immuno, immunologic effect, and it's not, a sig it's not blocking a signaling mechanism, um, at least directly. So it's really there as an antigen uh, for an, a target for the antibody. So it may be that very low levels uh, are all we need if we have effective drugs. I think the same is true for trope 2. You know, looking at trope 2 expression, we really couldn't see differences even in that heavily pretreated population in ascent in tropic so 2. So we do not recommend uh, testing. And we don't, as you know from the HER2 controversy, we don't even really have great antibodies for looking right. for very low levels of expression, which is probably enough for these drugs to work reasonably well. Um, there's another question about TDXD. We talked about ILD. Do you routinely do high resolution CT scans and how frequently? So I think um, that you have to pay attention. Um, many people will scan every eight weeks in the first few months. One of the problems with TDXD, though, it's unpredictable as to when the uh, ILD will occur, and it can be late. In fact, I think the median was about six months in, in most of the trials. So you have to pay attention, high index of suspicion. Uh, try to find it when it is asymptomatic. So high resolution CTs, at periodic intervals, even if you're not necessarily scanning for response that often, at least at the beginning, I think makes a lot of sense. Is that what you do? We do. So we make sure we have a high resolution CT and not a PET with a fused CT, because I don't think it's as good for picking up the early ground glass opacities, which is what you're looking for. It can be very complicated, you know, a patient with asthma or viral infection, et cetera, but we generally will take it as truth. You know, okay, ground glass opacities, we're going to hold a dose. And uh, whether you use steroids or not, you know, if you really suspect it's due to a viral infection, one of my patients recently, then I'll hold off. But otherwise, I give a half milligram per kilogram of steroid. I know from, uh, you know, there was a study done, uh, published in ESMO Open, looking at the risk factors for ILD. But that was when, you know, the higher doses were being given as well. So higher dose, of course, increases your risk. But interestingly, renal insufficiency did and being more heavily pretreated. So if you have a patient with renal insufficiency in that patient population or elderly, heavily pretreated, I usually get a CT, my first high resolution, resolution CT after two doses, so at about six weeks, the day before they come in for their third dose. For other patients, I do it at nine weeks, you know, just shy, as you mentioned, yeah. eight weeks. And then I, we continue doing that for most of the first year. It kind of depends on the patient's doing 80 seven to 88 percent of cases occurred in the first year. Uh, but there are sometimes late cases, and one of those cases was fatal. So I think we have to be cautious. You do not want to pick this up when people are symptomatic for the first time, if you can avoid it. There's clearly some individual susceptibility because uh, there are patients who develop symptoms right away, you know, right. first, yeah. first cycle. Um, so, and those patients, of course, have to go off. And there are a lot of people interested in testing retreatment with symptomatic ILD, but we can't do that in clinical practice right now. There's also a question about why do you think switching might work? Um, do you need to know the mechanism of res resistance before you switch? Well, I don't think we know the mechanism in a specific patient of resistance yet. So I think the trials that Hope outlined uh, about switching are going to be really important because that will tell us clinically if there's partial resistance or total resistance, if the payload is the same or if the antibody is the same. So I, I think we have to answer those clinically while our translational work is based on trying to figure out the mechanisms in general. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. There was a fascinating paper from uh, Leif Ellison's group at Mass General where they looked at a patient who uh, received sasituzumab um, and uh, when she died, they were able to do a fresh autopsy and they found that there was both trope 2 and topo 1 mutations in different organs. So there were different mutations in tumor in different organs in one patient. And then one patient had trope 2 mutation, one patient has topo 1 mutation. Yeah. And so you don't know. And so that's one of the reasons right now it's really hard to test. And this sequencing is going to be important to try and get tumor and understand whether or not we can predict who's going to benefit from sequence therapy. But I can tell you, I've had a patient who, you know, didn't respond well to SASTI, responded to TDXD, and the exact reverse, no response to TDXD and response to SASTI. So we need to understand this moving forward. We just don't yet. And it's a really a great question that somebody asked. Yeah, my anecdotal experience is the same. I've seen responses in both directions. Yeah, really. And, yeah. you know, we it's, wouldn't it's have expected. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah. And um, the, I think if you had triple negative breast cancer with HER2 low, 
What would be your first choice of ADC? Uh, my first choice would be SG, sesotuzumab, based on uh, the data. We have a, a, a large phase three trial and good overall survival there. And I think we need some more data in triple negative with small population DBL4. So uh, SG is my first choice there. I usually go with SG first as well. Um, and uh, I think, you know, we'll, we'll see. I mean, I, I'm guessing there'll be a lot of real world data over right. time. And we'll figure that out if you had a specific reason not to give SG or you can switch because of toxicity either way. That's really helpful. But right. I generally will use SG in a triple negative patient first. Um, and then a complicated and difficult question. If DATO DXD, if DATO DXD were approved, when DATO DXD is approved, um, what would be the advantages or disadvantages compared to SG? Uh, that's, we don't know the answer to that question yet. Again, the, the sequencing uh, data will, will be important. So uh, the payload's different, remember. Uh, the DXD is a very potent payload. So uh, it really goes back to what you were talking about. Is it a, a payload uh, resistance or is it an antibody target resistance? So we don't know an individual patient. We don't, and I think you know the issue is that for individual patients, there may be one, you know, one or more that are better. I mean, uh, some of it has to do with frequency of dosing, day one and day eight versus day one every three weeks. Some of it will have to do with toxicity profiles, as we understand more and uh, look at these drugs over time, um, and then additional data that will come out from the drugs. I think will also impact uh, which drugs are being given in which situation. Yeah, I would say initially it will be based on toxicity and based on prior experience for individual patients since we don't have the efficacy data. But I think we're pretty good at managing, figuring out which patients to treat based on their prior toxicity and uh, to favor one drug or another based on its AE profile. Yeah, I agree. And, I, I, you know, it's interesting. I don't know what the hair loss will be, but in our hands in the um, eye spike population, we saw a lot of alopecia with data, more than TTXD. Uh -huh. So mm -hmm. I don't know. Other people have had different experiences. So um, do you want to very quickly, we're just, we're over time, but I thought maybe we just very quickly go through the case just so. Sure, I'll, I'll go through questions. very quickly. So stage three breast cancer received neoadjuvant therapy, had residual disease and node positivity, and she got additional Cape Cytobine. Then Which we heard today doesn't work in basal-like disease, just in case you <laughs> missed the mini orals. Oh, yeah, I did. Thank you. Um, in, in, uh, she developed metastatic disease, and she got Pembro, Gem, and Carbo, and then progressed. So we're up to second line in a pdl one positive patient. And she receives uh, sasituzumab, has, does well with the first two cycles, and then develops acute cramping and diarrhea on cycle three during the infusion and then worsening diarrhea later. So what's the most appropriate next step for managing the cramping and diarrhea that occurs during the SG administration? Continue, and you can use your pads, I believe, for this. Uh, continue the infusion, it's expected. Stop the infusion, maybe hypersensitivity, slow the infusion rate, or administer atropine. Okay, so the answer is administer atropine. This is that a rare but acute cholinergic effect and can be abrogated by, um, by uh, do, using the atropine. Okay, most people voted for that. Great. Next. And, this, and then uh, she develops in cycle five a low ANC of 1100. That's on day one. What do you do with an ANC of 1100 on day one? based on the label. So continue and give pegfilgrastim. Hold it until the ANC recovers to greater than 1,500. Continue, reduce the dose level, or continue without reducing the dose level. Okay, and as per the, the label, it's uh, hold SG until the ANC recovers to 1,500. Do you do that? Uh, not typically, particularly Never. at cycle five, right? And then, and 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 in day eight, it's not infrequent to see ANCs of 850, 900, and uh, we tend to go on and give growth factor. Yeah, yeah. and we've yeah. actually been uh, really happy with using pegfilgrastim after day eight, and then sometimes right. you don't need to give any growth factor after day one. Works really well for patients, and they feel better. So that's become almost a standard for us. The pegfilgrastim. Yes, pegfilgrastim yeah. after day eight. Okay, quickly, the second uh, patient is a 65-year-old de novo metastatic breast cancer to bone, ER positive, 
HER2 negative, got palbo and astrazole, everlime is fulvestrin, and capecitabine, so two lines of endocrine, one chemo, now has progression, and she begins TDXD for her two low progressive disease. Um, so she receives uh, triplet uh, pre-medication for nausea, and in two cycles, she develops fatigue, dyspnea, and cough, and a high-resolution CT scan shows patchy interstitial infiltrates in both upper lobes with a low uh, oxygen saturation. So what should you do? Continue without modification, discontinue TDXD, start oxygen, console pulmonary and prednisone, one to two milligrams, two milligrams per kilogram, uh, or hold it, start all those other measures, and if it resolves in greater than 28 days, reduce one dose, hold it, do the other measures, and if it uh, should be in less than 28 days, reduce one dose level. So symptomatic patient with infiltrates. And discontinue uh, is the uh, correct answer here. This is a grade two ILD. We and can't see the bottom. Yeah, so can you scroll, scroll up a little bit so we see what people... Yes. Or down. So most people um, said to uh, resolve in less than or greater than 28 days. So um, just a subtlety, so if grade two, the label says to discontinue the patient, uh, which gets to Dr. Rugo's point about very careful monitoring of these patients. You want to detect grade one if possible because that can be treated and the drug can be restarted. With grade two, that is any symptomatic patient, start steroids, other measures, and at least per the label, the drug should be discontinued. Yeah, and I think that's really important to you start the steroids. I mean, this patient we would admit because they're hypoxic, oh, yeah. and so very hard to get oxygen delivered on the same day. Uh, and I think you want to give steroids and make sure that you know you intervene as much as possible. It's interesting. There are some patients who don't recover quickly with the steroids, um, although I haven't had that experience. And they've now been given more immunosuppressive therapy. You know, with the um, the pulmonologists who specialize in pneumonitis, uh, but we don't have data on the efficacy yet, although I've heard of a patient who uh, was treated, one of my colleagues' patients who got better, but stayed on, the, um, stayed on the immunosuppressive agent for some time. And I think getting pulmonary involved is important. Sometimes doing a transbronchial biopsy will help. Sometimes it is confusing, it could be viral, could be cancer with lymphangitic spread. I mean, there are multiple etiologies. So. Uh, keep everything in mind, but it is a diagnosis of exclusion for the most part, and it's the most common diagnosis if you have those infiltrates. And so we want to really uh, thank you guys for being here and sticking it out with us because we started late because of the horrible traffic, uh, which is really unequaled, including when Taylor Swift was here. I've never seen traffic like that. You know, the, uh, you know we hope that you've enjoyed this session, which had sort of a unique combination of different areas, including you know, trying to manage what the patient wants and the information we can provide to patients, uh, improving access and information. Uh, we want to know the, the patients as a person as much as possible and understand unique needs. Uh, we have shared with you the most uh, recent clinical trial data until Sunday uh, regarding ADCs and the care of your patients with HER2 negative metastatic disease. Um, and uh, then, you know, electronic health records are really helpful for us. We've talked about managing adverse events with a lot of experience from our group here, uh, which also hopefully you felt uh, was helpful and you certainly answered the questions really well, so that was good. Uh, so uh, with that, we'll uh, thank you very much for your participation. Uh, we also answered the questions that were put on the iPads, which we really appreciate as well, uh, and hope to see you during the meet rest of the meeting. Thank you very much.